Now, um, we're gonna jump right in. Okay. Cool. Um, so Thomas Decker has had a long career as an actor and a musician, spending nearly his entire life in the entertainment industry. Today, he joins us to give us a small glimpse into that world and to share his passion for the for being an involved member of the LGBTQ plus community. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're our first guest of the year, so this is very exciting. Wow, made in 2022. Um, where are you zooming from? My house at the moment. Oh, nice. In, in uh, good old Los Angeles. It's very yes. rainy. I know it's a little gloomy today here in LA. Um, before we dive into our uh, more serious questions, because I'm a foodie, I want to ask you, do you have a favorite restaurant that you would recommend? Here in LA? LA or anywhere in general? Right. I really love a restaurant here in LA called Pache, spelled P-A-C-E. It's very romantic. I like to go for like, it's very chill. It's in the canyons. It's like hidden. It's Italian. It's very good. I also like for more fun kind of chill place. There's a place called Fred 62. That's like a really crazy weird diner type vibe on the east side, but they have like a really big vegan menu and it's cool. So if you're in LA, I'd say Pache for fancy and Fred 62 for fun. <laughs> I've heard of Pache, but I haven't heard of the other one, but I'm definitely gonna have to check both of those out. So you have like a like a, a good date you want to, you know, Pache is a good place for a, for a date night, I think. Nice, good, good to know, <laughs> noted. <laughs> um, so, Tell us what does Camp Lightbulb mean to you? Because we know you uh, were at one of our holiday fundraiser parties in 2018. Um, so what has getting to know Camp Lightbulb been like and what is uh, its meaning to you? Well, I think what's kind of amazing about Camp Lightbulb is like every single person I've uh, mentioned it to or talked about it with every single person I speak to says boy I really wish that was around when I was <laughs> younger it's such a beautiful thing um, to me it's just about community and feeling completely safe to flourish and be yourself I mean it's really it's the microcosm of how I wish the whole world was operating you know that it's a fully fully um, a full community of support and you know, appreciation and understanding and love for our, you know, what makes us unique as opposed to what makes us blend in, right? That's what I get from the organization. Exactly. And it's good that we have these weekly clubhouses because we don't have to be limited to just the summer camps. We can kind of connect and, uh, you know, have that whole feeling of community like all year long. I know that is really nice. It's very special. Technological miracles. I know, right? Uh, we're in the Zoom era now. <laughs> we are definitely in the Zoom era. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your work as an actor. Um, who are some of the of your favorite people that you've worked with? Oh my God! I mean, yeah, I uh, I just had my thirty fourth birthday, and next year I will have been an actor for thirty years um, mm -hmm. consistently. So I've worked with a lot of great people. I think. Um, you know, one must wonder in life if we sort of design it to be the way we want it to be subconsciously, because I think probably the biggest thrill for me is that a lot of the people that I idolized or, you know, worshipped or was a, was a fan of growing up are now my friends. And that is still something that is a bit surreal, um, and, and, but a major gift that I still kind of can't believe every day. Um, so I don't know. I, uh, I've worked with some really, really, really special people. And on every project, I think I've worked with someone who's shaped me in some way, you know, has made an impact um, one way or another. Obviously, I got to work for John Carpenter when I was six, and I didn't know at the time how cool that was. But um, now being like the biggest fan of his movies, I, I, I think that one's pretty cool. But that's like the fanboy nerd in me as opposed to the like actor who learned, you know. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I know you got to work with uh, Lena Headey, who 
everybody knows as Cersei from Game of Thrones. Yes. Um, Lena played your mom. She was Sarah Connor. So what was that like? I mean, my God, like we, I've said this before, you know, Lena was kind of, I was having been on sets my whole life. I was still very, very shy and private. I think because I was, my queerness was very closeted and I, you know, was just sort of navigating. When you're a young person on a set filled with adults, you kind of, you, you grow up kind of looking at the world a bit differently. And Lena was the first person who was like, no, you're not gonna be the shy, silent, quiet one in the corner. I'm going to bring you out of your show and we're gonna have some fun. And she did that and um, we were, inseparable the whole shoot of the show obviously we work together every day but then we would <laughs> spend every evening and weekend hanging out and um now you know so long ago but um we're still in touch and um you know she's doing great but yeah it was a real I was I was 18 when I got Sarah Connor Chronicles so it was a it was a moment in my life that was very pivotal um both career-wise and personally and Lena was a huge part of that so I'm I forever have love for Lena. She definitely seems like uh one of those light-hearted like jokester type of people that so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> very but I think awesome. also she, was, she was I should mention um at the time you know due to the era and due to it being a network show and what was kind of going on culturally Lena was the one person who made it very clear from the get-go you know I was I was honest with her about myself and she was a major support system and she was someone I could be fully open with and in that work environment, that was a very rare opportunity. So I thank her for that. Yeah, it's always great when you kind of find your chosen family in that way. Yes, it's all about the chosen family. Thank so you. you mentioned you recently turned 34, happy birthday. Thank you. And you, you've been an actor for 30 years so that you, you've been an actor since you were about five years old, right? Yeah. So what was, what was that like being such a young actor? Um, you know, fortunately I didn't have uh, crazy stage parents or anything. Um, my parents were in the arts and I was the only child and I sort of fell into it. It was actually through singing um, that I kind of got into acting as a little, little kid. And it just kind of kept rolling, kept snowballing. And my parents were always very conscientious of making sure I was enjoying it. And I always was. So it just kind of kept going <laughs> and I, I certainly, when I was about 17, I thought I was done. I had a job application at a record store. Remember when those existed? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> not, I don't know. Um, and I was ready to be out. I was ready to, to just kind of create and be out of it. But it's a thing that it's, it, you know, it's been my life for a reason. And I think you reach a point where you kind of go, okay, this, this has been a long haul. Am I, I'm either in this or I'm not, and I'm in this, you know. Um, but at the time as a child, it was just a joy. I just, I had so much fun. I loved it. it there were obviously like <clears throat> a lot of pressures and stresses that came with it. And I didn't get a traditional school experience because I was schooled on sets my whole life. So there's that, but I got, I got other stuff out of it. Yeah. And it's a good thing you didn't take that record store job because where would it be <laughs> now? <laughs> It would have been fun, probably, but yeah. It would have been fun for a little bit until everything was digital and it, yeah. Yeah, and actually that was Amoeba Music, which was a legendary place here in LA that finally just left, well, it, it moved. We didn't lose it entirely, but the classic yeah. location is no more, which is sad. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I noticed that. I walked by it recently. Um, so how has, because uh, you mentioned that you were very closeted earlier on in in your career, um, how has being an actor affected how you explored your identity? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, you know, it's impacted every facet of my life, right? So it's impacted that part of myself too. And I, you know, I was, I consider myself, obviously I'm very happily married to my husband, you know, currently. And, but when I was younger, I was very fluid, right? Sexuality was very fluid for me. And I was sort of, I wasn't someone who knew right away kind of <laughs> everything about myself. It took me a minute to kind of, and again, I think to answer your question, I think a big part of being a child actor, right? Is you learn very quickly how to um, be what someone wants you to be. 
you know, your job is to really walk into a room and figure out how do I get these people to like me, trust me and respect me and want to work with me from <laughs> near infancy. So when you're dealing with your whole journey of figuring yourself out privately and personally and coming out and all of this, it gets very impacted by sort of who you're allowed to be and depending on who you're around, you know? And so it makes it, I think it in many ways made it even slightly more complicated for me because it's not just weighing up. Am I comfortable with myself? Am I comfortable sharing myself with who's close to me? It's also, am I comfortable sharing myself with the world before I even really know what I'm sharing? You know, so it's, uh, it, it definitely impacted it, but it also was a gift of positioning me in environments and spaces my whole life with queer people and with um, accepting people and supportive people. And so, yeah, there, there's been great um, <laughs> assets and great drawbacks from, from being an actor my whole life and my personal journey. Yeah, and I feel like that is, obviously something that we all go through when we're trying to figure out who we are and to have these obstacles in front of you wasn't easy, but now you've been able to get through that. And I feel like we're moving in a direction where that's less and less of a problem. So we see so many, um, you know, queer celebrities like Kim Petras and we have, um, so many content, so much content out there that we really, I mean, it just seems like weird for anybody to have to struggle so much, but mm -hmm. I feel like we're, we're just getting there where it's not gonna yeah. be as much of a struggle. Um, progress. Yeah, progress for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so you start in a film called Kaboom that was directed by the famously queer director, Greg Araki. Um, you played Smith, who is an 18-year-old uh, college student. How did you relate to Smith? Um, well, I recently wrote a thing on my Instagram about this movie and this whole experience. But yeah, it, I, was, I was just 21 when I played it. And I was just off of the Sarah Connor show. <laughs> and um, I would wanted to work for Greg Rocky since I was like 17. I think when I, when I first saw the first movie that I saw by him and for anyone who doesn't know who he was, you know, or who he is, excuse me, he in the early nineties really was kind of the pioneer of um, what was called new queer cinema. And it was a really important movement that happened kind of originated at Sundance and it was Greg and several other directors. And they uh, really pioneered this kind of new movement of, you know, queer filmmakers being able to use their voice honestly and authentically in whatever way they, they saw fit. And I know now that kind of sounds almost like, well, of course, but <laughs> at the time it was pretty revolutionary. And um, so I just was determined, I think, I was, de I was A, determined to work with him because I loved his work, but I was also determined to work with him because of the impact I felt his work had on, on you know, my chosen family of the world. And I really wanted to be a part of that. So it was, a, to, be, to answer your question, making the movie was actually not that fun because I was so stressed out the entire time to do a good job for him. I was so stressed out and the movie was like kind of on my shoulders and it was a lot. But um, once it was finished and I saw it for the first time at Cannes with my mom, which this is a very intense movie to see with your mom. <laughs> um, I just, it was like the high of my life. It was the moment of my life kind of being like, okay, here we go. So it was great. Nice. So um, it was a life goal accomplishment, you would say. Yeah, in a weird <laughs> way. And again, now Greg's a good friend of mine. So again, it's like, I, I still am kind of humbled by those realizations. <laughs> was um, working with Greg different than any other director? Um, I would say working with Greg as an experience was very different than any experience I've had because uh, Greg really takes a long time to make sure you're who he wants <laughs> before he casts you. And once he casts you, he really kind of just leaves you to do your thing. He's very precise technically, but on the sort of performance character arc, he trusts you to really kind of manage it on your own for the most part. And so it was, that was new. It's very different from, um, it's very different from television where everything is so rigid and it's very different from kind of big studio movies where everybody wants to kind of micromanage. 
um, this was a really free experience. So that was different. Oh, nice. So as we talked about, there's a lot more queer representation in TV and film today. Um, why do you think that is? Because we've all been working really hard for it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, in all honesty, I, I think that um, I think that progress comes from hard work and sort of a kind of constant peaceful protest <laughs> in a way of sort of um, asserting ourselves and addressing ourselves and saying that there are many of us who have stories that we want to tell and want to hear. And I think that, um, you know, the industry has been slowly waking up to everybody to <laughs> do that. There is a, mu a multitude of stories to be had here. So I've seen that really change. Really yeah, change. I feel like there's a lot of like queer people that are working behind the scenes. And now that we get to openly be ourselves, as opposed to, you know, decades ago, I feel like now we're getting the stories that need to be heard a little bit more from yes. these people, from the creators. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they're being allowed to create authentically, you know, without, yeah. without too much apology going on in there. Exactly. Um, so you're also a musician, as you mentioned, and you recently released a new album. Um, how has music allowed you to express yourself in a way that acting hasn't? Music is really um, different for me from anything else I do, you know, because I, I, there's acting, there's writing, directing, there's everything. But music is the, is, has always been the thing that, um, <laughs> this sounds, this is not, this is going to sound different than I mean it, but it's, it's the one thing where I'm not sort of constantly thinking of an audience, like at all. That's not to say I make my music for myself and no one else. I, I very much care about the listener on a deep level, but as a kind of a, a way to govern what I do or what, it, what I'm working with or the sound or what I'm trying to say. It's very personal, very private and very intuitive. So music for me is kind of like really like putting my diary out there, you know, my, my journal of, um, of feelings. And, and oftentimes music for me is kind of a, a tool in, it's a kind of a therapeutic thing, you know, it, it kind of helps me figure out what's going on. Um, inside and and it's definitely I always have worked in spurts like I'll work in like there'll be a two-year period where I'm just making so much music constantly and then I like won't make any for a year you know it's uh so I don't know quite what that is but it's a very instinctive thing I call those moments of inspiration like yeah. when you're an artist it comes when it comes you can't really control it and you have to grab it exactly past you. exactly um <clears throat> Do you have any advice for young queer people that are interested in music or acting? I will give the advice that uh, I, I received a couple times but wasn't prepared to hear at the time when I was slightly younger, which is, I think if you're going to pursue any kind of um, arts-based expression, it's just all about you <laughs> and what makes you you and harnessing it in the right way. I was often under the impression, I think even on a subconscious level, maybe we all are culturally, that we're always trying to fit something. We're always trying to check that box. We're always trying to, you know, look a certain way, be a certain way, dress a certain way. So we give off this impression of who we're supposed to be. And really all of that is here already. It's just about finding a way to, like I said, kind of harness it and calibrate it and balance it um, so that you can communicate with your audience in whatever way you're choosing to. But it has to be in a way that makes you happy and makes you feel confident in your vulnerability. Um, because if, if, if you're not, I think uh, others can sense that and you can sense that. So you don't commit as fully to what you're trying to do or say. Yeah, being your authentic self is very important and it's something that you shouldn't compromise. I know that, you know, the authentic self, it's, it's terminology that's very <laughs> impressive right now. We hear it a lot, but it really is, it's so important. Um, I think it's just crucial to, to our individual development. It's so important. It is. Um, so we are going to open up the Q&A to our campers. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, 
So if anybody has a question for Thomas, here's your chance. Let's see. Uh-oh. Nobody has a question. <laughs> Don't be shy now. I can see all of you, so you might as well see. <laughs> I guess I'll ask a question, but it's kind of like half formed. <clears throat> um, right. Earlier, you mentioned something about um, progress coming from constant peaceful protest. And I guess my question would be um, your opinion on the role of um, sort of non-violent protests just because of the role that that's played in um, queer history and progress? I think protest is crucial. I mean, like I said, peaceful protest. Uh, I think that, and I think that when I, when I said peaceful protest, I didn't mean necessarily the literal form of, you know, always that it's a protest kind of the way we imagine it. But I think a protest of your spirit, of your character, you know, of, of defending what makes you you without apology and without kind of shifting to, to fit people. To me, that's a form of protest by saying, no, I am presenting myself to the world. And perhaps there's parts of myself that the world I think is unprepared for, or maybe it is, and that's okay. You know, to me, that's a form of personal private protest. And I think that that's um, really important. But I think protesting in general, it's, it's how we often are heard. Don't know if that answered. <laughs> no, that was, that was very good. Um, yeah, we keep, uh, I mean, if you think back, like being gay was illegal not too long ago. So just like being yourself in a way is a protest in that sense. Yeah, and it's important to remember how far we've come. You know, we've, we've come, if you look over the past hundred years, we've come really far. Um, but a lot of that progress has been relatively recent, you know, and that's why this is a constant, this is a constant movement forward. Um, yeah, and, it's, and I think as much as we have to be determined to, to continue this progress and to move to the next um, step, we also need to be, appreciative in ourselves in what we've accomplished and in the world that where we are compared to where we were. It's a, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. And knowing your history is important, which is why we need that uh, LGBTQ plus education in schools for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you for your question. Um, who's got another question for Thomas? I can sing songs in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can ask questions. Go for it. Um, what was your favorite production that you were in? What's my favorite what that I was in? Like production, movie, oh. show. Oh boy, oh my God. Oh my God, that's really hard. Um, doing uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles was, was like the most fun, I think it was, and it was also the most fun I had doing something that I also thought was good. <laughs> I've had a really good time doing other things where you kind of know at the time that's not so good though, but this was, this was a little bit of both. Um, I also did, which we were just talking about uh, history. Um, I got to play someone named Lance Loud, who was a really important um, LGBTQ figure in the 70s, and he was the first openly gay um, person on television. It was the first reality television series. It was called American Family, and they did, HBO did a film called Cinema Verite in 2011, I think we did it, and uh, I got to play this person, and he was this incredible, he was a punk rock singer. He wrote for Andy Warhol in Interview Magazine. He, he you know, just went to New York and was in the La Mama Theater and all these, you know, great, great, great people. And so um, getting to play this kind of legendary and important member of the community was a real thrill and something I still um, am, you know, honored to have done. 
Do you think that somebody will be playing you someday? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Will it come full um, circle? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see on that one. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Nisha. Any others? I have another question. Okay. Oh, all right. So, okay, so uh, you were in American Tale 3. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what was that experience? I love that movie. Oh my God. Well, as a little kid, I did lots of voiceover. I was also Littlefoot in all the Land Before Time sequels. Um, not the, I wasn't in either of the first ones because I was like a baby um, when they came out, but I did like six Land Before Time movies and two American Tale movies. And it was great. I just, again, through singing, I got into voiceover um, because I could sing as a little kid. And so, but I'd actually, American Tale in particular had been like a favorite movie of mine when I was really little. <laughs> so I remember, even though I was like, seven or eight when I got that it was still like oh my god like I'm gonna be five old Moskowitz um so it was great it was like you know voiceover is fun you go in for a couple days in your pajamas if you want and you sit in front of a microphone and, and do it it's fun <laughs> that sounds like the dream job to just I mean, <laughs> voiceover sounds amazing <laughs> All right, any other questions for Thomas? I have one. I'll go for it. It's Katie. like music related. So like for me, I've noticed how music can really kind of help influence like moods and help with pain and everything. I just kind of wanted to get your perspective on the whole connection with music and how it can help with like medical conditions, if that makes sense. I mean, I think music and sound is power. I mean, it's really, it's, it's a healing, um, it's such a surreal concept, right? <laughs> like if you, if you imagine you try to explain music to someone who's never heard it, it it's, it's, <laughs> it's near impossible to do. Um, but I think that, I think, I think all uh, art forms have the, have the capability of really reaching you. And, and affecting you and um, shaping your life. Certainly for myself, there are <laughs> numerous things that I can turn to in that way. But I think music particularly, it, it works on a, on a, on a very um, instinct-based area, right? And we're kind of then, at least to me, good music, the, the mind part of it comes later. Um, and I like films to be that way too, but that's a whole other conversation. But I, I do think that music really has the power to to heal and to drive and to, you know, I have my little five songs that are in a constant rotation in the morning and they shape my life, you know? So, in, so yeah, embrace that connection that you have with music because it's something quite sacred and, and it's yours, you know? I definitely have my go-to songs that like put me in certain moods for sure. Yeah, oh yeah. Any other questions for Thomas? I actually have a question. Oh, was there someone? Aylan, did you want to go ahead and go ahead? Oh, you go ahead. Ask one. It's fine. Oh, I think somebody's muted. Is that what's oh, happening? There we go. I've already asked one. It's fine. Oh. <laughs> Ask as many as you would like. Yes. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I have a question about. Um, we we're talking earlier about um uh queer representation and i have a question about um your opinion about the relationship between queer representation and media and progress specifically like do you see um queer representation as more of a driver of progress or something that comes in the wake of progress specifically like um once in once sort of there's been enough progress that mainstream representation can exist and like be profitable. That mainstream representation. Ooh, there's a lot of there's a lot to answer in there. <laughs> um, I think it's both to answer the first part of your question. I think that progress comes from 
the push and drive of queer representation and queer representation is a result of our progress. It's, it's working in tandem. Um, I think that, I think if I understand the rest of your question, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the, I think what's gonna happen soon is, you know, mainstream entertainment industry and culture, I think now has reached a place where we found a good balance of queer representation for non-queer people to help them <laughs> see us, understand us, you know, be aware of us, etc. But I think now we need to move to the next step of the evolution, which is where queer voices are exploring queer themes, queer stories that matter to us, that are not about sort of explaining or reaching, you know, across, we're all kind of heterosexual, homosexual, queer, mainstream counterculture. I think we're moving in the direction of where all is going to get a little bit more of a balanced, you know, attention paid. Um, and, uh, and I think that's gradual and it's happening now, which is really exciting. You know, I'm trying to, I won't say much about it, but the film that I'm in the process of getting to make next is very much, um, you know, a, a personal project connected to my experience as a, as a queer person. So, um, and I'm, I'm in the fight currently for certain things to be a certain way because it's what I feel is correct, you know, culturally as we move forward. So, yeah. You're out there shaping our culture, Thomas. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to do my part. We all are. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions for Thomas? I've just got one question. Um, if you had to give um, a, I guess, recommendation or tips for young queer people trying to find their own sense of self, do you have any tips or recommendations for that? Yes. Uh, <laughs> and that I'm still working on that. I think we all are, sorry, at all times. Um, it's, it's what, what's done the most for me is to really try and get rid of the noise, try and <laughs> separate yourself from what's influencing you and really sit with yourself and communicate with yourself and respect yourself as, as <laughs> something deserving of respect and care and attention and start a conversation with yourself internally. You know, this is, it's not just about um, figuring out your sexuality or, or even your place in the community. It's really about your journey here on this earth. I know everything I'm saying sounds very uh, <laughs> new agey, new wavy, self-helpy, but I've been on a long road and I've tried um, the other ways of going about this. I've tried the um, other outlooks in life and they fail you eventually if you're not coming from a from a real place of security in yourself and that's only going to come from love and confidence and acceptance from you it's not going to come from an external force and I know that sounds really scary and really intense but it's it's really there's nothing like it when you reach a place where you know you're 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 good with yourself it's a I think that's the, that's the, and it's a thing, it's a, it's a work every day. It doesn't stop. It's a daily process, but be very gentle with yourself at the same time. Very good advice. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions before we um, say farewell to our friend Thomas? Okay, this is my last question. <laughs> my last question. Okay. Um... If, you, if there was a movie made about your life, what would be the main plot line and who would you want to play you? Oh my God. <laughs> the who to play me question, I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> as far as the part of my life, um, I, 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 think, uh, I think that the, the period of my late teens and early 20s, as far as... Um, my relationship to my industry and the world at that time, I got to, I got to really see some amazing progress happen right before my eyes. I mean, I really got to kind of, this was a period of immense 
kind of revolution happening everywhere in both great and small. So I think that part of my <laughs> life and career would be interesting, but I don't know. My favorite part of my life is, is the my, my marriage and my, you know, just getting to create. So I don't know. I, I guess it would depend who the movie was for. <laughs> Well, we'll, def we'll definitely watch your movie, Thomas. For oh, sure. thanks. <laughs> Hopefully someone good makes it. I don't know. Well, you can have your friend Greg make it. <laughs> Greg's got way more important stories. <laughs> but maybe one there. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to jump into our variety show soon. So we're going to say farewell to our friend Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I love Camp Lightbulb. It was so nice to meet everybody. And yes. Thank you. And you're welcome to come back anytime. Okay. Be kind to yourselves and others. Bye, Thomas. Uh -huh. Bye, Thomas. Thank you. Bye.